Welcome to another episode of my wake up call. This is the podcast where I find out a little bit about my guests and then I want to save finding out a lot about them for the podcast because I know you are listeners and when my guests post the videos, you are viewers. I want to hear the story behind my guests, how they became who they are and how they are. And I'm really looking forward to today speaking with Wendy Smith. Uh, because along with her co-author, Marianne Lewis, they are the co-authors of a new and much anticipated book, Both and Thinking, Embracing Creative Tensions to Solve Your Toughest Problems. And I'm really looking forward to this because uh, I don't know about you, but the divisiveness, it's not even either or. It's zero sum game. It's zero sum game with people taking delight in being uh, the one who's the winner and you being the loser. And so I'm really looking forward to this and to Wendy educating both me and all of you listeners. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She's the Dana L. J. Johnson Professor of Management and faculty director of the Women's Leadership Initiative at the Learners College of Business and Economics at the University of Delaware. She earned her PhD in organizational behavior at Harvard Business School, where she began her intensive research and strategic paradoxes, how leaders and senior teams effectively respond to contradictory yet interdependent dem demands. I want to unpack the heck out of that. Uh, she's Worked with executives and scholars globally. She received the Web of Science Highly Cited Research Award in 2019, 2020, and 2021 for being among the 1% most cited researchers in her field. And she received the Decade Award from the Academy of Management Review for the most cited paper in the past 10 years cited is not the same thing as implemented, but cited isn't bad. Uh, her work has been published in such journals as the Academy of Management Journals, uh, Administrative Science Quarterly, Harvard Business Review Organization, Science and Management Science. She's taught at the University of Delaware, Harvard University, and the University of Pennsylvania Wharton, while helping senior leaders and middle managers all over the world address the issue of interpersonal dynamics, team performance, organizational change, and innovation. I need to exhale. Ah, that's a lot. You know, it's interesting. We were talking about a mentor of mine, Warren Bennis, and I remember going to a tribute to him, and it was either Betsy Myers or Dee Dee Myers. I, I, I keep confusing them, but one of them was his mentee. And she said all these wonderful things about Warren and Warren gets up and he says, you know, one of the best things about people saying a lot of nice things about you is it gives you something to live up to. <laughs> and that was so uh, much like Warren. So, so Wendy, I will ask you what, what it has been the through line in your life. And I think you're going to be able to, give us one of the more thoughtful answers that I've heard from my guests because it's written all over that introduction. So what has been the through line and your purpose and and why have you been drawn at this time in your life to both and as opposed to either or? Mark, first of all, thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be in conversation with you about these ideas, especially since um, so many of the themes that you've brought to this podcast resonate with these ideas. So, so thank you. And, you know, I, I guess I would have to say the through line is this idea of both. And uh, it's something that I can trace back to growing up. Uh, it's something that has infused my thinking and research over the last 20, 25 years. And, and I so value that you started off by noting just how critical it is for the world that we live in today because, and we can dive into this a bit more. Um, as you said, my research really started out thinking about leaders and leadership, how they navigate this idea of strategic paradoxes or the tensions they feel in their organization between today and tomorrow. 
social and financial, and so much that my colleague Marianne Lewis and I have been thinking about is how powerful and poignant and needed these ideas are for our political world today, just how politically polarized we are and how we can move beyond that kind of either or thinking. So I want you to elaborate on that, but I want you to unpack a little bit. You said growing up, there was something about both and that attracted your attention. And can you share a little bit about that? So were you noticing that there was a lot of either or going on and people bickering and gee, why is it that people can't cooperate more? What What is it that you noticed growing up that drew you towards both and? You know, I think it's just this, my, my own circumstances of seeing how different pieces can come together to a more, uh, a broader whole, a, a bigger whole. I, uh, um, you know, I, I was, I, I sometimes think of myself as a third culture kid and, you know, the, the idea of kids who are born in one place and live in another. And while oftentimes third cultures are really distinct cultures, I, I wasn't, I was born in Canada and Montreal and um, grew up in the States and South Florida. And we moved at a time where there was a ton of political strife in Montreal. So when we moved, we moved with a ton of other uh, Canadians living in a what felt like a Canadian exile community in the United States. And it really did feel like there was this sense of two different ways of thinking, two different ways of living. We were, we, we were never fully Americans in that mindset, but we were also not, when we would go back to Canada, not yet fully Canadians. And for some people, and we know from the research on third child kids, for some people, that kind of experience can feel really disenfranchising and lonely. And for others, it can feel like there's greater opportunity. And I think my experience was the second, that there's places and to and ways to learn from one culture and inform the other. And um, seeing that, experiencing that, I think was more expansive and opening for us, for me, rather than restrictive. And that might, th I think that's one of the triggers that invited me to think about, well, what does it look like when we are experiencing the world? What else is out there? And how can we bring that into the ways that we live and experience? So can, give us some examples through your life and your career about seeing the opportunity in the uh, in the divisions between people and how they could be brought together. So g give us a couple examples of that at various times in your life. Yeah, you know, the, some of the early examples I would point to uh, weren't so both and. They were kind of, you know, I, I think that as academics, they often say that research is me search, we research our blind spots. And I did a lot of either oring. And so, you know, one example was when I started my PhD, um, I, uh, or even I'll, I'll just go back one before, when I was making a career decision, I was really grappling, wanting to understand leadership. I, I loved the idea of, I had been a youth leader as a kid, but I was struggling between doing leadership and studying leadership. And that felt like a really big either or until I realized that actually, and it felt like I had to make a choice. Was I going to be an academic or was I going to be, uh, you know, in academia, we say practitioner, a leader, a manager, someone in the real world. And that felt like a big either or weighty choice. And then when I went into my PhD, I um, was really interested at the time studying social responsibility. I had an amazing advisor studying innovation. And that also felt like an either or. Do I, do I take advantage of these opportunities to study innovation at the time with IBM, with amazing access to fabulous leaders? Or do I study social responsibility, which is what I was really interested in? And it felt like passion versus opportunity. And um, I struggled with that for a long time. Only retrospectively would I say, or would I be able to articulate and be really clear about what the both and was there because taking advantage of the opportunity of studying IBM introduced me to this notion of paradox. It was in studying IBM leaders that I was able to see them grappling with this tension of today and tomorrow, innovate and existing products. It was through then studying paradox that I came back to and was able to open up and think more about social responsibility and the tension between social and financial and self and other and missions and markets and be able to be much more expansive in the way that I study things. 
in the moment, it felt like a real tug of war though. And, you know, I think one of the things that we find, and then I'm happy to sort of think more about and talk more about is just that it, both and thinking and adopting a both and approach sounds good. And it's challenging. It's emotionally hard. We feel that tug of war pulling at us, that, that tension, that anxiety. And, you know, I got caught right in those. So I want to tee something up, and uh, and I, I I'd like your input on it. A few years ago, I think it was the Business Roundtable uh, redefined the purpose of a corporation, or it was the Conference Board. I confuse those two. Uh, it's either or, you know, uh, either it's one or the other. Uh, but uh, but they redefined it away from Milton Friedman, who said the purpose of a corporation is to deliver shareholder value. And that's it, uh, which may explain how Jack Welsh killed General Electric. But that's another story in another book. But how do you apply both and to this notion that it's now uh, stakeholder versus shareholder capitalism, because even though that was a lofty announcement and a lot of people, uh, um, I think Larry Fink from BlackRock said, this is what we're gonna do. Right. Can, can, you, can, you, can you share something about how that can be managed? Because public companies still feel this pressure, you know, share price, earnings, what's it gonna look like? So. Can you weigh in on that using your both and fr framework? Yes. When I, when I, before I went back to grad school to get a PhD, I was uh, a management consultant and it was um, the time when Enron was falling along with WorldCom and all of these uh, ethical dilemmas were dragging down organizations. And uh, at the same time, companies like Ben and Jerry's and the body shop were really uh, expanding this idea of businesses for social responsibility that became the social responsibility movement and the sustainability movement that we're in today. And I remember talking a lot about this with my colleagues in consulting, and there was such skepticism. There is no way that companies really do think uh, altruistically or adopt the socially responsible practices. It's all greenwashing or it's all, there's just a lot of skepticism that these two things could not go together. That if you're going to do, and it was the Milton Friedman approach, if you're going to do, um, if you're going to focus on profits, you have to focus on profits. You can't also focus on some broader social agenda. And if you're going to focus on a social agenda, you have to be go be a nonprofit organization. And what is so exciting for me as I teach these ideas to my students and possibilities is seeing real world examples of organizations that challenge that thinking that say, actually, it's not just that both of these things can exist. It's that they can reinforce and benefit one another, that attending to a broader social purpose can enable more effective profits or, or, or expand profits. And in, in the book, we, um, we profile a, a leader that we think is excellent at this, and that's Paul Pullman, who shifted Unilever from to the packaged goods company in that's headquartered in the UK and in uh, the Netherlands. And that, that, that in 2008, this was a dying company. And by 2018, when he left, this was a market leader. You know, they, they own product, they own brands like Dove Soap and Axe Shampoo and uh, Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream now. And the way he did that was by implementing the Unilever Sustainable Living Pro Plan. And that plan said, we are going to double our profits through in at it with in, in the service of uh, reducing our environmental footprint in half and making a difference in the lives of billions of people around the planet. And that's how they did it. Now, it's not easy, but it was a strong commitment. And Paul Pullman is now out uh, working with other CEOs to think about how other companies can do this as well. So can you dive into that a little bit because it uh, uh how he was able to get the skeptics on board or did he identify the dyed in the wool skeptics and said bye bye uh, <laughs> it, it's just not going to work uh we need you to embrace this both and approach and we really 
we're, we're not just paying lip service to social responsibility. So can, can you share a little bit about how we was able to do that? Yeah. And Mark, you know, it's a little professional hazard, but when someone asks an or question, did he get the skeptics on board or did he get rid of them? My gut reaction is, well, it was both. It's both and. And that is indeed the case that that um, he, you know, he put in place a number of practices that made a strong commitment to this approach. So the first thing that he says he did uh, that he did and that he very much talks about and that is really key to both and thinking is that he started out by articulating a higher purpose. For Unilever, it's making sustainable living commonplace. And for him, that means that they are committed to sustainability and they are committed to the bottom line. And then he set out this plan that really articulated a very strong set of metrics goals, very specific about each one of these. And then he was very clear uh, to say, these things are gonna come in tension. You know, if, if, you know, for his leaders, it's like, okay, well, that's all good, but do you want me to reduce the pollution from this plant or increase the, the profitability of this manufacturing plant? And his answer is yes, which is probably incredibly frustrating. And he knows that. So he says, look, I want you to put the tensions on the table so that we work through them so that, because I know that it's in those tensions and in working through them you know, I don't see that as a bad thing. I don't see tensions and conflict and opposition as a bad thing. I see it as an opportunity, but it's only an opportunity if we surface it, raise it, and think about the creative possibilities. So he, he, you know, if people wouldn't be bringing it to him, he'd say, where are they? What are the tensions that are, are here? How can we talk through them? And to your question, some people came on board and some people didn't. And some people Indeed, you know, he had to say thank you, but this is not now, this is now not the company for you. It, it was both. I interviewed a fellow named Mark Johnson who co founded InnoSight with Clayton Christensen. And uh, Mark is a wonderful uh, person, and he has a book called Lead from the Future. Yeah, and what they focus on is an approach called Future Back, meaning go 10 years in the future not one, three or five year, not near termism, but go 10 years in the future and then do a deep dive and then future back from that. And and one of his clients is one of the automotive uh, uh, companies. And I remember him telling me that they thought, oh, electric cars are just a fad. But by the time they did a deep dive into 10 years into the future, Everyone said we got to make electric cars. So, so I'm I'm wondering how any of that resonates with what you're talking about. So, how you can, you know, there's a saying I've heard: you can't solve a transformational problem with transactional solutions. Right. right. But so much of the world runs transactionally that it's tough to pry people away from that mindset into something that is both and. So any thoughts or comments about any of that? Yes. It, you know, the idea of, I, I love that. And it's something that resonates and it's something that we think a lot about. And when I say we, it's my colleague, Marianne Lewis and I, um, future looking into the future, the long horizon is a critical skill for engaging both and thinking in the moment. So if we are going to be able to bring together, bringing together opposing ideas. So the, the core of both and thinking is that we bring together opposing ideas for more creative, sustainable solutions. If we're going to do that, there's often a lot of conflict in the short term. To navigate that conflict, we have to look out to the long term to see the bigger, broader and long term possibilities, because that's what both motivates us and enables us to live in the short term. We sometimes use the metaphor of um, of looking out at the horizon on a rocky boat, right? So if you're on a boat and you're feeling that seasickness, you look out to the horizon to feel more stable. And that's true as well if you're in the moment feeling the seasickness of opposing demands. Do I focus on, you know, at Unilever, minimizing the amount of packaging for shampoo or knowing that if we have a smaller bottle of shampoo, it means we make more revenue. Well, that's like, there's like a lot of back and forth there. 
Uh, but if we look out to the horizon to say our bigger picture, our bigger goal is making sustainable living common, you know, commonplace, enabling us to live on a planet that we are able to see for the long future, well, then those choices become less rocky, less unstable, or feel that way. They feel less rocky. So uh, this podcast is a conversation. And uh, can I share an exercise with you that if you like it, you're welcome to borrow? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, and for those listening in, you'll just have to follow the instruction. But if you're seeing a video from this, you can do it. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to uh, uh, outstretch your right hand and, and look at your index finger. No. Okay. Put it in front of you. Okay. And I want and I want you to focus on your index finger. And do you see that the wall behind your index figure is double? Yes. Double vision. Yes. Right? Now I want you to focus on the wall behind your index finger. And do you see that your index figure is is two index fingers? Yes. So this exercise is a way to get leaders and management on the same table because the leader can say, look, I am looking at the wall. I am looking at the vision. And if I paid attention totally to the index finger, which is how you live your life, uh, I'm not going to be able to head towards that vision out there. And the managers are saying, well, if I let go uh, of my index finger to look at your vision, I'm going to see a double index finger. And I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to mess something up. Yeah. And so the idea is, well, uh, how can we create a both end conversation? Because uh, this exercise enables managers to viscerally understand a leader's point of view and uh, for a leader to understand a manager's point of view. So, so if you I like love it, that, Mark, I hope I can use that. I will give you full credit. I, I love that. Uh, but it, could you feel it viscerally, the difference? Not only can you, yes, you can feel it viscerally. And, you know, one thing that it raises for me. So um, I, I know some of your listeners think in metaphors, and, and I think that's a great one. One of the things that it surfaces for me in this long-term, short-term conversation is also the value of going back and forth between the long-term and the short-term. That actually, it's not just about shifting our our vision out to the wall. It's also about shifting between the wall and the index finger. There's a both and there. There's a both and in long term and short term. And, you know, that is an invitation to managers and leaders as well to think about their decision making that we have to, that in, in shifting our attention to the wall out in the distance, it invites us to rethink the decision in the moment. And we're going back and forth between those. Yeah, you know, and what you just said uh, triggers something else. I uh, uh, another both and challenge is work life balance. Yeah, uh, they often seem like either or things, and and the people pay a lot of lip service to it. Something that uh, uh, colleagues, my colleagues, and I have figured out is um, everything in life competes for time they don't compete for importance. Mm. Your spouse and your children are your most sp important spouse and children. Your career and your job are your most important career and job. Uh, the key is to be totally present mm. when you're in one of those roles so that when you're there being a mom or a dad, uh, uh, that you're not dragging in your worries about work so your kids can't get your undivided attention. Or when you're back at work and people are calling upon you to be focused, you you can't drag in. Uh, yeah, but I, I got to make that uh, that teacher conference with my kids. And so what we recommended is that people develop what lawyers know how to do when they go from one unfinished file to the next, how to quickly be totally present in whatever role you're in. And when you uh, and you can practice this by looking at your schedule for the week, but have as a mantra that wh wherever I am, uh, I'm going to be totally present uh, because whoever I'm with, that's the most important person in my life when I'm with them, as opposed to dragging 
one role into the other. So, so it it it, it kind of comes down to that some of these metaphors, there is a disconnect that you know that you know AM radio and FM radio, you can't play both at the same time, but you can switch from one to the other, right? And and fully enjoy each of them. Uh, but as, as you say, there's going to be a tension if you try to reduce both and into a singular silver bullet. Give me a silver bullet that covers both of them immediately at the same time. And it may be that you can't do that. But what you can do is realize that they're both important and they both deserve your full attention when you're attending to them. So any thoughts on that? I well, thank you for saying that. And I just want to lift up that idea. Uh, you know, when we talk about both and people will often ask us for that ideal win win, the ideal integration, the ideal thing that accommodates both sides of competing ideas. So we talk about and, and that is one outcome of both and thinking. Uh, we talk about that as the mule, because the mule is this ideal hybrid between, you know, it's stronger than a donkey, smarter, smarter than a donkey, stronger than a horse. It's this hybrid, right? And and you know, this the example of this that that we'll often point to is Einstein's theory of relativity. The theory integrated what it meant for an object to be at motion and at rest at the same time. And when I, I think I, I started out saying that I, I started studying teams at IBM, how they were navigating their existing product and their innovation. And I expected them to have a lot of these mules, a lot of these ideal win-wins, this creative integration. And what I found is that that wasn't the case, that it was much more what you were just talking about, which is this ongoing oscillation, micro shifts between these two sides in, and then what that meant for them was that they would have to think about how do they allocate their resources. Sometimes it was the existing product, sometimes it was the innovation, but they were shifting back and forth. And so we use the metaphor of a tightrope walker there, and it goes exactly to what you were saying, that to move forward on a tightrope, you have to look out in the distance and keep focused, but then to you're, you're never fully balanced you never find that like sort of full integrative moment you're always sort of making these micro shifts back and forth left and right and you're not going too far to the left where you fall over and too far to the right it's these small micro shifts and so i'll just say like when it comes to work family issues this makes a lot of sense to us because the ideal integration you know when i i have um twins and when my twins were born the ideal work family integration would be something like I'm going to open a daycare and my work will be a daycare. And, you know, maybe for some people that is something they do. And that was something I was never going to do. So I was going to do what most people do, which is figure out how to live between decisions where sometimes it means I'm coming home for dinner and sometimes it means I'm staying late at work. And if I keep those in this oscillation and this, this balancing rather than a balance and not overemphasize work into the point of burnout or overemphasize home to the point that my work suffers. That's a way of living in this both and different from the mule of the win-win. I love that. And, and I love the distinction between balancing and balance. And that the, the, it, it almost feels like people want to be able to achieve balance so that they can just sort of say, okay, we've done that. Check that box. Let's go to the next thing. And that if you can instead uh, immerse them in, no, it's, it's a continually balancing uh, uh, thing that you do to, to be able to live both. And, and it may not come naturally because you want to be able to check a box and say that's done, but with practice, the balancing uh, actually makes you more, I guess, adaptive, more agile, more flexible, more able to go with change. And yeah. uh, that is more creative, more sustainable. And I think, and this is probably a world that you know much better than I do, right? It, it's not that you just, it, it is that you want to check a box. It's also that the balancing is kind of anxiety provoking. I mean, you're at the top of a higher high wire over some buildings or you know, even if you're thinking about it as riding a bicycle, like you could fall over. And so there's anxiety in the balancing because there's uncertainty, because it's not conclusive. 
there's anxiety in it because there's all this research that says not only do we want a clear choice, but we want consistency in those choices. And the balancing is not about consistency. We talk about it as being consistently inconsistent. So so it's it is emotional. It is difficult. It is um challenging. What are some uh nuggets? Uh, what are appetite with uh, some things from the book that are hidden in plain sight where yeah. when people discover it will say, I never would have thought of that. That is fascinating. Can you share a few of those with us? I love that. You know, um, one, uh, one of the reactions to the book has been, oh, both and, isn't that so obvious? And uh, one thing that we're finding that actually is quite exciting is how much our society is using both and language, right? So we see this in, we, we talk about this political opponents, Barack Obama and John McCain, both talked about the and and the importance of the and. And we're seeing this in corporations using and, and consultants using the language of the and. The, the, the challenge is moving from the what we say the label to the approach, from the language of we're saying both and to actually implementing it. It, it might be obvious in the knowing, but not obvious in the doing. And that's why we wrote the book was because we have a community of amazing colleagues, academics, scholars that have been doing research about the doing. How do we do this? And um, the book was a chance for us to bring together our research as well as these colleagues into, into the doing. And so I'll just say as, as some maybe uh, appetite wedding nuggets, um, what, we, what we point to is we say there's sort of four big components of the doing. And for the ease of mnemonics, we use A, B, C, D. Uh, the A is assumptions or our mindsets or how we think about these tensions, these paradoxes, changing our mindsets. The B is boundaries or the structures that we that we put around us to scaffold the experience. And, and by boundaries, it could be anything from the goals that we set and the roles that we play and the people that we surround ourselves with. The C, and this is one that we've been touching on and is really important, is the emotions. We call it comfort. And we talk about the importance of finding comfort in the discomfort. And the D is dynamics or the way in which we put practices into our life to ensure that we're constantly changing, as we were saying before, being agile, experimenting, trying new things and shifting up our responses. So A, B, C, D. And a key idea, and I'll just put this out there and happy to, is, is that, you know, so that's how we, so the first step is seeing that there's paradoxes. The second is adopting both and thinking in these four buckets to allow us to engage those paradoxes. And the third is then noticing that the ways of engaging paradoxes is paradoxical. We say navigating paradox is paradoxical. And what we mean by that is that uh, these tools are themselves contradictory and interdependent. It's it's head and heart, you know, emotion and cognition. It's it's the boundaries we create, the stability that enables the change, the dynamism, and it's the change that allows the stability. So I, I would say maybe paradox 2.0, both and thinking 2.0 is going from understanding both and thinking to realizing that these paradoxes, this both and is embedded in how we navigate paradox. There's a word that comes to mind as I'm listening to you right now, which is surrender. Oh, letting go. And the idea of surrendering that the belief that or the assumption that I can only live and function in an either or world, a black or white world. And it frames the way I look at the world, even though it hasn't worked out well in personal relationships, professional relationships. So I have all the data that says this either or, or thinking is a really a limiting belief. But yeah. uh, can, can you yeah. elaborate a little bit on that? Because what I, I'm a therapist by training. Yeah. And what I find people can surrender control, it frees them. In fact, I've done a fair amount of work on how is it that psychedelics and uh, work on the brain, and usually they work well on control freaks in which being in control hasn't worked for them other than a very narrow area that makes them enough money to go to Costa Rica to go visit a shaman and, and have ayahuasca. 
but but it, it seems like the benefit is that uh, you're guided through something where you let go of control because you're out of control when you're under the influence, but you have a shaman or a therapist who says, no, uh, uh, yes, you're psychotic, but it's only temporary. What's happened is, you know, your your con your controlling personality hasn't worked for you, and this is ripping it apart, and uh, you're going to get through to the other side, and when you get through to the other side, guess what? It's going to be more organic than it is forced. So I, I so I have no idea what I'm talking about right now, but I wanted to throw it up for your consideration and the notion of that surrender, because it would seem that for both and to really be internalized by a lot of the world, there's going to need some element of surrender. Okay, I get it. You're right. Either or hasn't worked, has never worked for me, uh, but I'm really scared to let go of it because it's all I know. There is so much in what you've just said to engage with. Uh, the Here's the place that I will go. Uh, it, what it reminds me of is some of the conversations that my husband and I have had. And so um, so it's so taking both and thinking into the parenting world. So my husband and I have very similar values on what we're trying to, what we want in our lives, in our children's lives. And we often have very different approaches to those values. And that has in the past led to some conflict, things about how do we discipline our kids on screen time, or how do we think about bedtime or whatever other parenting debates one engages. And my husband and I are also very uh, strong-willed people that can get a little stubborn and that leads us nowhere except conflict. And that part of the coming, that what we have learned over time is that coming to better solutions for our kids, for our family, is about listening to one another and letting go of the control we each feel that we're right and the other one is wrong. And that the surrender, and, and, and so therein lies the both and. It's not either his discipline style or mine, and they're not so dramatically opposed, but often it felt like one of us is right and one of us is wrong when it's simple things like, is bedtime eight o'clock or nine o'clock or 10 o'clock? Where's the right and the wrong in there? And, but it's surrendering that one of us is right and one of us is wrong and listening to the other and coming up with moving away from we have to make a decision between the two of us to finding a solution together. And the, the letting go, the surrendering there is partially letting go of our either or thinking. It, it's also letting go that I'm right and that if I'm right, the other person has to be wrong. And there's a lot of letting go in that, you know, I can, you know, if, if you imagine how challenging it can be in our parenting, now imagine what it's like for a leader of a, you know, million billion dollar company, letting go of control with so much at stake. The reason we hold on to control, you know, and again, I feel like this is so much more your world than my world, but it, the reason we hold on to control is because of the underlying fears that, you know, that we're trying to deal with. You know, and I'll, I guess I'll just say one more thing, because I saw a lot of this with uh, the pandemic, that um, there was so much uncertainty and we all tried to create these either ors, vaccines or not vaccines, masks or not masks, isolate or not isolate. And the solution set was so much more complicated than that. But because there was so much uncertainty and fear about the consequences, what I was watching was people trying to pick a side and then hold really tightly to that side. And that is the and that control, the hold tightly to that side was a way to try and ameliorate some of the fears. Well, if we could just honor the fear, recognize that it's there, live into the uncertainty, maybe we can let go of some of the control and then let go of some of the either oring. Well, you know, you hit me with a chunk of stuff to unpack. I hit you with a chunk of stuff to unpack. This is this is, my listeners are going to go gaga over this. So I just want to <laughs> share that with you. But you triggered something though. Can I share a little bit of a marriage counseling, couples counseling? You may not yeah. need it, but something. Yeah, that we I'll were... take, we'll take counseling and we'll take, we'll take any kind of advice. <laughs> this, this was always a real, getting better. <laughs> this was a real breakthrough many years ago. I think many, many years ago, it was actually before we had children and my 
and my oldest child is 40. Uh, but I remember my wife and I were getting into a tiff about something. And uh, she would say something uh, which made me wrong. And then I would say something which made her wrong. And then I came up, I don't know how I came up with this, but I said to myself, what's it like for her right now? Mm. So right. rather than loading up with my next little tit for tat and, and, make, and taking it down a lousy road, I paused and I said to myself, what's it like for her? So what happened is instead of trying to be convincing, I became curious. And then I paused and I thought, I don't think she likes this any more than I do. And so she was waiting for me to come back so she could react. But instead I paused and I said, uh, do you like where this is going? <laughs> he said, no. I said, you know, I don't either. Um, uh, and I thought you might not like where it's going. Do you have any idea how we can keep it from going there? And she looked at me and paused and then she smiled and she said, no, but you're doing good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there was something about, you know, becoming aware of inside myself when I was escalating, when I was becoming defensive, when I had to be right because I couldn't stand being wrong. And there was something about just letting it go and just being really curious where the other person's coming from. And I'll share something with you. This is something I'm trying to teach the world. I uh, I spoke in Moscow along with Daniel Kahneman, uh, yeah. who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow. And a bunch of my books have done reasonably well in uh, Russia. So we were speaking to a thousand Russian uh, businessmen and women. And I'll send you a video clip if you're interested, because one of the things I'm trying to teach the world, which started in Moscow, and again, let's not get into politics or the war. These are wonderful people. And what I shared with them is I said, uh, underneath you listening to me, you're listening for something. And if I can let go of any agenda that I have and just be curious what you're listening for and listen to that, with a beginner's open mind until you get it up and out. And then if I can serve that, this is going to go pretty well. In fact, the way I'll send you the video clip, I said, if I focus on you listening to me, I give you a bunch of bullet points. Right. Most of them won't work for you. Uh, but And you'll say, well, it'll work for him. He's an expert. He's a psychologist type. Uh, but if I give you some good stories and I'm entertaining, you'll give me your mind for an hour. And then I switched to my NPR voice and they didn't understand my voice, but they heard my tone. It was less AM and more FM. And I said, but if instead of focusing on you listening to me, giving you bullet points and you giving me your mind for an hour, I focused on what you're listening for. And if I get what you're listening for without you telling me and I deliver on it, you'll give me everything. And then I said, are these the things you're listening for? If you're in business, you're listening for a way to get better measurable results because that's how you get a promotion or a raise. Is that true? Da. And you're listening for a way to do it that's less stressful because the way you're doing it now is you're drinking too much, you're eating too much, it's a mess. Is that true? Ah. And then I said, and what you're most listening for is that I can give you something right now that's immediately doable by you and you don't have to buy a book. And I haven't written this book yet and I may never write, write this book. And you don't have to take a course because you don't have the you know, the freedom in your mind to take a course. But if I could give you something that's immediately doable by you and you don't have to be a psychological type and it gets you better results that are less stressful, would it be worth all the money and a day of your time to come here? And they went, da, da, da. And I said, okay, quiet, quiet. I have to give a presentation here. <laughs> but, but, are, but are you following it that I think yeah. there's a way yeah. that maybe the way for all of us to get to both and 
is to recognize when our ego is too attached to something yeah and just letting it go letting it go i want to i, I want to go back to your story you were talking about with your wife and and bring us right back to where we started which is what would that look like that kind of instead of trying to assert our points of view pausing being curious, listening, being open to another person's point of view, what would that look like if we brought it into this realm of political polarization? And, you know, and again, you started us out by saying there's so much either or that's so paralyzing in our society. That's not just happening at the political levels, that's happening in our relationships with people who have different political points of view from us. And instead of listening to them and accepting both anding that they these people also have really valid values people who have different points of view from us they have valid values they have something to say and that we could come up with a more effective solution by listening to each other and working together and at least respecting each other we're not doing that we're dehumanizing each other so the either or becomes we talk about it as trench warfare right we we each side picks its position, it digs its trench to be safe, and then it doesn't engage with the other side, it just shoots out at the other side, right? And 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 what would it look like if we were able to listen to someone with very different political positions than us? We don't have to agree with them. We just have to give them the respect that we validate and value their point of view. We accept that they have a different point of view in the same way that we would want that. How much more would we in the fabric of our society globally be able to work out some of our bigger problems? Boy, if we could only apply that. I'll, I'll share something. You may have fun with this with your husband. Uh, something, because I, I did a lot of couples therapy when I was actively in yeah. practice. And sometimes the couples would be escalating in some argument in front of me. And, uh, and this is especially true with the male ego more than the female ego. And uh, uh, and in a lot of times the male ego would think that you're saying to them, "I'm right and you're wrong." And and if you ask the other person uh, what they're really saying, is they're saying, "I'm not saying you're wrong." I'm just saying what I believe in. And there's a lot of the male ego involved in which they hear things as, I'm not always wrong. Right. You know, I, I'm not stupid. I'm not incompetent. I mean, you know, I'm able to earn a living. I'm not always wrong. But the male ego frequently hears it that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It may, I, 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 my hypothesis of why the female ego doesn't hear it that way is because if you have young children, you know you got to get stuff done uh, when they're not paying. You know when they're when they're having a temper tantrum, they're not going to sleep. So you have bigger fish to fry than whether you're right or wrong. You got to get the kid to sleep because you got to go. You know, file a report or something at work. Mm -hmm. But uh, but but I've noticed that with a lot of men, they uh, they hear that all they hear is you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. You don't know what you're doing. And where they're coming from is, I'm not wrong. Yeah. So yeah. It's, an, it's an interesting way to unpack that kind of conversation. So I, you, we, um, oh, I'll just say we like to point to the uh, Hindu parable of the blind people and the elephant. Mm. That elephanters might have heard, right? The idea that all these blind people approach an elephant, hit, touch different parts of the elephant, and therefore come to a conclusion of very different things. So. One person touches the tail and thinks it's a snake and one person touches the the legs and thinks it's a trunk tree trunk and then they you know and they get into an argument about it and then instead of listening to one another and understanding how to put the parts together to a more effective whole uh, and more a more holistic approach there's this argument about who's right and who's wrong and so sometimes we talk about, well, what does it mean to move beyond our positions into the out to see the elephant, the elephant in the room, which is a good thing in this case. That is wonderful. Um, you know, these podcasts have sort of a life of their own. And I, I think my personal purpose is to whet the appetite of our listeners and viewers for more. And you have more than whet their appetite. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I want to thank you on behalf of the listeners. I want to thank you on behalf of me because you've more than hooked me on wanting to do a deep dive on both and uh, thinking and why it's a, it's a matter of national international crisis right now. So if you're listening to this yeah. and you want to fix what's going on in the world, please, please, please buy both and thinking, go watch other interviews, uh, with Wendy Smith and Marianne Lewis. We're all in this together. And the more both and we can do, uh, maybe we can actually pull the uh, future out of where it seems to be going. So I just wanted to thank you for being on, Wendy. Mark, thank you so much. This has been such a rewarding and energizing conversation. So thank you. Well, it goes both ways. And thank you to our listeners. And please share this with the uh, other uh, people that you think will get something from it. And I think they'd have to be deaf, dumb, and blind to not get something from this one. So please share this widely. And until next time, when wake up calls come your way, wake up, don't beat yourself up, but wake up. I think you'll be glad you did. Take care.